Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. My plan for today is I'll share sort of the highlights of a collection of stories, and then I'm around all day. And so if you want the details of any of them, um, find a way to get in touch with me here at CVPR or any other way. So for the last couple of years, I've actually focused a little bit more away from hardcore computer vision questions and tried to understand how we can use computer vision to help uh, understand more about climate change. And so there's a project I'm working on that's looking at very large scale monitoring of uh, phenological responses to climate change. Phenological responses are things like when trees become green, when they bud, when they lose their leaves, um, natural li annual life cycles of, of the climate. And I promise we're going to get back to image data before too long. But the kinds of questions that we care about in large scale monitoring of climate is how do various parts of the environment, like the length of how much light a particular area gets, the temperature or rain, govern the timings of different uh, biological cycles, and then how will that respond uh, to changing temperatures and, and other parts of climate change? And those are important things to understand in terms of trying to understand how the bio, biosphere will adapt to climate change, and that's an important part of the feedback cycles. And so the way this is done right now is mostly with either large-scale satellite imaging. This is the moderate resolution imaging spectrometer, which constantly circles the globe and gives uh, about once a week data products that say how much uh, biomass is at every location around the globe. At things like pixel resolutions of about 250 meters per, per measurement. And it's actually going overhead all the time, but it gives weekly data products because often, like perhaps here, things are under clouds all the time, so you have to wait at least a week in order to expect to see the ground. The alternative is a small collection of point measurements. And so this is, these are cameras from the PhenoCam data set, which a guy named Andrew Richardson helped set up and who I'm working with now. And these are locations that are measured usually with uh, small towers. And the towers are just high enough to get over whatever the, the, the plants on the ground are. So sometimes they're quite tall. Other times, especially in the American prairie, they can be like 10 feet tall. And they have crazy amounts of sensors on the tops. So they might have gas chromatographs. They might have a sensor, which is essentially a piece of scotch tape that slowly rotates through and collects the particulates that are in the air. And then once every six months, somebody goes and, and collects the scotch tape and cuts it up into the, about the spot that it was each day and does more formal chemical analysis. And so um, about six years ago, I read a paper by Andrew Richardson who says, we are looking at climate change by mounting webcams on these towers, on these 16 towers. And I said, well, 16 towers is kind of amateur. This was my first email to him. It was two lines long. I said, would you like to try 24,000? And he wrote back three days later and said, I think I would. And so we have started to use this, which is sort of my pet project, the Archive of Many Outdoor Scenes, which is a log or a data set of images captured every half hour from every publicly available webcam that we've found in the world. And most of those cameras uh, go back about three years, and, and the earliest ones go back to March 2006. And so these green dots are approximately the locations of these cameras. We have a few more in Africa and Asia now, but overall it's very dense across the US and Northern Europe, very dense in Japan, and somewhat sparser elsewhere in the world. And I collect this data set intentionally as a resource for um, any purpose. Um, so it's publicly available at Amos, Archive of Many Outdoor Scenes, .csd.wistle for Washington University and St. Louis.edu. Uh, the front page has the most recent picture from uh, 20 cameras. You can click on Next many, many, many times to see all 24,000 cameras. And my, uh, my, my goal today is to tell you how we managed to organize this set of imagery into something that's useful for a collection of um, either computer vision or climate change problems. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is when I say webcam, I mean camera that's mounted outdoors, not the webcam that's on somebody's computer. So all of these webcams are cameras that create an image that goes on a web page somewhere. And we have a little Java program that right clicks and saves as that image into our database. And the second thing I want to emphasize is these are not our cameras. So they were put up by random other people for whatever reason. And sometimes those cameras, or often those cameras, have interesting failure modes because the people that put them up may not care that much about them. So maybe they're highway cams or 
randomly put on the side of your building cams or whatever. And we have lots and lots of interesting failure modes. So many cameras are often just uh, in cloudy areas. This camera has been looking at the brick wall literally for the last six years. I imagine it was mounted and looking in someplace sensible at first. But then since then, it just has fallen off and nobody's cared. There's often failure modes in terms of the imaging geometry with cameras that are looking through water drops. That is sort of an interesting image geometry that we could exploit perhaps, but it's hard to calibrate as the drop is rolling down the, the image. Um, but some of the cameras are sort of more sensible. So relative to satellite images, they're down low and underneath the clouds, so they can see things even when it's cloudy. They're relatively well scattered across the Earth. So this is one at Scott Air Force Base in Antarctica. They look sideways instead of up and down, which means that if you're trying to understand something about atmospheric particulates and what the atmosphere looks like, you get resolution in terms of the altitude of different layers of particulates, that which you wouldn't get from satellites looking straight down. And they see individual trees. And while the biosphere is sort of a global phenomena, and we're mostly interested in changes in climate at a global phenomena, those changes happen at the scale of individual trees' responses or individual organism responses. So it's very useful to be able to see individual responses over time. And from each of these cameras, we have a many-year archive. And we can show that archive in various ways. And so this is a visualization of one year's worth of data that's organized by time of day and time of year. And it shows things like days are longer in the summer than they are in the winter. And it shows variations in the appearance of a scene across the day, which often comes from lighting variations. And then variations in the scene over time, uh, which might be interesting, either biological or human changes. And so this is the data set that we have. Uh, if there's one thing you want to take away today, like find ways to use this data set. We're perfectly happy to share it. You can download the data. There's Python scripts to download different slices of data in different cameras and so on. And that's part of the reason that I'm doing this, is to share this. But in order to make you understand the pain that we went through to do this, I want to talk a little bit about what it took to build this data set and the sort of five main tasks that we thought were important in order to be able to organize this data so people could use it for different projects are first to find the webcams, then geolocate where in the world they are, then visualize the data from them, then as much as possible calibrate what the cameras say field of view and direction is looking in and then annotate those scenes so that if you have a particular type of query, like I want to find where there are trees, be able to make a searchable database so you can find all the cameras that have trees. So I'm going to talk about um, mostly finding, geolocating, and visualizing uh, the data, and then a little bit at the end about some applications. So the way we found them is it turns out that you can do clever web searches to find cameras. Things like view slash index.shtml is a URL string that occurs largely in web pages that are automatically set up when you buy a webcam, stick the CD into your computer, and say, make me a web page. And so, so sort of a set of 20 or 30 clever searches like this that can find maybe 10,000 webcams across the world. That wasn't enough. So if you think, if any of you are interns here and you think your intern job is boring this summer, I hired two undergrads to spend the whole summer looking for webcams. We went to every state in the United States and every country in the world and searched for Department of Natural Resources and Department of Parks and Department of Transportation and everything we could think of in order to find archives of webcams and scrape the, the metadata from them. So sometimes the pages that a webcam has have interesting metadata. Other times a page looks something like this where it doesn't really tell you very much about the camera. So maybe you know that .ch is the Switzerland um, um, country code, and so you might imagine that this is in Switzerland. That's actually a, a cue that is sometimes wrong, because often there's aggregator sites that aggregate webcams from around the world, and, and so the, the location, the IP address where the camera is may be wrong. And otherwise, you just get a picture like this. And so the first thing you want to do in order to understand anything about sort of any global question is understand where the camera is. Um, so we're going to get to that in a second. Sorry, out of order. Um, the second thing you might want to do once you have a lot of data is find ways to visualize that data. And the most simple visualization is just when do I have data for this camera. So this is another example of the summary image. And so this is time of day by time of year. And each pixel in this summary image is the average color of the image at that time of day and time of year. And the red streaks are places where the data is missing. Um, so this is a sort of data availability plot. If you go to the Amos site, this is live on the Amos site. You can click at any spot and get the picture from that time of day. 
So you can click along this boundary and see, for instance, the time lapse of dawn every day at this camera. Um, so that's one visualization. That visualization is showing the average color of the entire image. You might want to show a little bit richer of a description of what's happening in the image. And so we use uh, principal component analysis applied to image data as a way of projecting all the images down onto a lower dimensional space to get a richer visualization. So everybody knows principal components, I imagine, at this place. But um, it's interesting when you do principal component analysis on data that is from a fixed camera because you get richer components than you usually do for unstructured imagery. So we take images, we move them column vectors, we decompose that into a set of basis images and a set of coefficients. So basis images have a lot of structure because since the image is static, then the types of things the, 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 the components code for are things like lighting variations across the scene. So even something like the second component here says this wall is brighter, this wall is brighter, make the other wall darker, and that's sort of interesting structural information about the scene. And then we also have coefficient trajectories, and those coefficients are coefficients of images that were captured through time, so it makes sense to plot them over time, and you get very characteristic coefficients of essentially all outdoor scenes, where the first coefficient is often the day versus night variation, and the second one is something about morning versus evening. And this is already enough to give you lots of structural information about a set of images. So if we look at an image at night, it has, it's in this case, low on coefficient one. If we look at an image in the day, a clear day tends to be an image where this component varies a lot from morning to evening. A cloudy day is an, is an image where these are sort of murkier differences between morning and evening. And so I find this compelling because something as simple as PCA can give you a really rich decomposition of what's happening in an image um, in terms of important weather conditions. So this lets us make a richer uh, visualization. So this is the same time of day by time of year plot. And now instead of each pixel uh, summarizing the average color of an image, we can set the first three coefficients to reconstruct that picture as the red, green, and blue channel. And so in this uh, summary image, these colors don't have any intrinsic meaning, but pictures, pixels that have similar color are likely to be pictures that are similar. And so you can read off, essentially, the cloudy versus sunny days in this. So the, the, the days that are orange are, are sunny, and the days that are sort of this murky purple in this image are cloudy. And if we flip between two, we can see sunny versus cloudy. And so you get this really nice picture of even what is the weather at this scene over the course of this year, all just from computing PCA on sets of images. That might be a reframe, keep computing PCA on sets of images. Um, sometimes the, this summary image uh, isn't, like, has, has these sort of uh, discontinuities. This turns out to be because these webcams were not uh, mounted by us, and we don't control them at all. And so if the camera moves, then principal component analysis, since it's a linear technique, has to use sort of one of its components in order to try to characterize the difference in the, in the viewpoints. And so this summary image is also useful to tell sort of mundane things like when the camera moves. If anybody has questions, I adore questions, so shout them out any time. Um, so all right, so this is our data set. We have ways of visualizing it. Principal component analysis already does an interesting job of decomposing parts of the variation of that scene in interesting ways. When we want to think more carefully about how the outdoor images might vary over time, um, we use what we call the geotemporal image formation model, which is something like a generative model that tries to relate what an image looks like to all the factors that uh, might affect it. And those factors start off with, if you go to a particular location in a particular time and take a picture, like you'll get one picture at that location in that time. And that picture varies due to a couple things. Some affect the overall appearance of that scene. So what is the scene structure? What are the transient objects at that moment? What is the weather? Like is it cloudy? What direction is the sun coming from? And that creates what we think of as the view sphere, which is if you had a panoramic image taken with some normalized camera at that location, that panoramic image is defined by these things like scene structure and weather and lighting. And then there's the particular image that you captured because you probably didn't take a panoramic image with a normalized camera. So there's some orientation and calibration of the camera that you used. There's some way that the camera lies about the color that it's measuring. There might be some imaging noise. And all of those combine to define the image that a camera actually takes. So we don't think of this formally 
as a probabilistic graphical model, but we think of this sort of informally as a way of understanding what are the, the component parts of the scene. And Stefano Suato, over the last couple of years, has been developing an image information theory, which sort of is his way of justifying to the people that have funded his research why computer vision is so hard. <laughs> and the, the, his, his justification is that all of these types of things end up causing, or, or many different components in this model end up causing similar image changes, which is why it's so difficult to decompose them. So for instance, slightly different amounts of atmospheric particulates can change the color of the sky just a little bit in almost the same way that various color calibration parameters can change the color of the sky. So many of these types of changes have that flavor and therefore they're difficult to decompose. But if you want to take the positive view of the same thing, it says images are affected by all of these different components. So if you have images, especially if you have an archive of images, you might be able to use them to go back and measure any particular part of this. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to go through sort of different things that we can try to use this model in order to understand about a camera. So the first one is geolocation. So we're going to say, imagine that we have lots of images and we have know their capture time. We want to understand their geolocation and we want to use lighting variations to understand that. And so things like the summary plots by time of day and time of year and the average color of the image actually essentially uniquely define where in the world a particular camera is. So this camera is near the South Pole. There's a day of the year when it becomes light all day. And that, tr that, that this sort of track of when, when is night and when is day uh, is unique to a particular location in the world. But you can think of that as just knowing when dawn is tells you the longitude and when, how long the day is tells you the latitude. Um, and we, this is a good enough cue across all our cameras to get within about 60 miles of the geolocation across the world. And I think it's only that slow that, that bad of um, accuracy because we're capturing images only every half hour. If we had a richer, uh, denser data set, it would, it would work better. Some of our cameras are mounted on cruise ships, so they have particularly <laughs> compelling um, time of day by time of year brightness plots, including this one, which must have gone around the world over the course of the year at some point because when night is relative to Greenwich Mean Time has wrapped, and so this cruise ship went around the world which I think is compelling to see. Um, a slightly uh, richer geolocation cue is to say, let's uh, continue in the model where we have the image and the capture time. Let's uh, try to solve the geolocation. Let's try to use weather variations to solve the geolocation. And the key part to that might be factoring out the lighting variation. So to factor out the lighting variation, we can do something as naive as just take pictures every day at noon. So let's take pictures from all our cameras every day at noon, run PCA just on the noon images, say, from a month of, those of that data, and then sort the images by their first principal component, by the coefficient of their first principal component. And for almost all outdoor cameras, that gives us a variation of sunny to cloudy, sunny to cloudy, sunny to cloudy, and every once in a while there's a scene where uh, human variations dominate. So this is almost certainly uh, weekday to weekend at a parking lot. But that means that from each camera, from something as simple as computing its PCA components for images at noon, we get a signature of cloudy, cloudy, sunny, cloudy, sunny, sunny, cloudy, cloudy, sunny, cloudy, cloudy. We can go to a satellite map and then say which pixel on the satellite map has the same signature of cloudy, cloudy, sunny, cloudy, cloudy. And that gets us um, geolocations. Um, and my favorite one is this one. So this is actually our closest one. It's within like three-tenths of a mile, which is way more accurate than we have any right to expect because that's smaller than the satellite pixel resolution, but you know, sometimes the rounding error goes to your favor. And what's compelling about this is this camera doesn't actually look up at the sky, even though it's using cloudy or not cloudy. Uh, that first principal component codes for shadows that this building casts onto the, uh, onto the ground. So even though it's not looking up at the sky, it's still sensitive to these cues. And overall, we get, um, more than 80% of the cameras within 50 miles um, using one month's worth of data on this. OK. How many cameras would you ground truth for that? How many So some of our cameras we scraped from sites that provide metadata that we chose to trust. So some of the highway cameras and a lot of our cameras came from something called Weatherbug, which was a box that a company convinced elementary schools in the US to buy that computed weather data where they were, and they sort of stuck a camera on for no apparent reason. 
Um, and so we trusted those, and so that was our ground truth for that. And so we had a couple hundred cameras that were ground truth. OK. So uh, I, I started off this talk by talking about trying to think about large scale phenology changes. So once we have cameras that we believe we know where they are, we can start looking at things like the changing albedo in the scenes. And so these are the types of seasonal variations that our cameras view. This camera is particularly good because it sees lots and lots of trees and the variations are really vibrant. It turns out that the current state of the art in the biology community for measuring pheno changes from images is to measure a greenness score, which is how green the pixel is divided by how red plus green plus blue the pixel is. So that gives you a number between 0 and 1 of how green a pixel is. And here are various plots from our webcams that were not put up with the purpose of doing phenology testing. And uh, there's sort of a, a sigmoid model that is fit to the greenness score to get the onset, midpoint, and end of the phenology change. And so if I take, so we managed to do this for hundreds of cameras. If I take one of them to make it bigger, this was the region of interest that a mechanical turker drew for us nicely on this. And here is our fit for the, for the um, pheno changes. And these three points correspond to the three pictures. And what we found that was compelling about this is in this camera and in most cameras that are in suburban areas, there's a substantial difference between when we saw the phenology change and when the satellite estimate of the phenology change is. And it's not just a difference. So it's a difference that it's about three weeks on average. And it's not just the three week error. It's always a biased error. The satellite estimate is always early in these suburban areas. And the reason it's always early is because these suburban areas have a lot of grass. And so as soon as the grass becomes visible and green in the spring, the satellite looks down and that pixel is then as green as it's ever going to get. And so we found a systematic bias across a large part of the, the US in suburban areas in terms of estimating these greenness scores. And at first, we just thought there was a difference. But the nice thing about our webcam data is we can go back and validate. You can look at this picture and say, well, these trees, it's really not green. It's starting to be green. And here there's leaves. And so we're convinced that this is not measurement error on our part, but we're really seeing something that the satellites aren't. Can you try correcting that bias and saying then how green must be in cities compared to the, the country? So you'd expect it to be a little bit earlier when you're in the cities. You'd expect it to be early in the cities because the cities are warmer? Is that the? Okay. Yeah, a little bit warm. Heat island effect, also potentially street lights and things like that. But probably during, during greening up, then that's having less of an effect. But yeah, you'd either expect it to be online or slightly earlier. That's right. So we have tried to fit a model that's based on the local GIS data, like the type of terrain that there is and the latitude. We haven't had a model that, I mean, we can predict it somewhat. But we haven't had a model yet that we think is, um, that we believe, like the, that, that corrects the error substantially. But that's sort of one of our active things that we're working on. Um, yeah, I would love to say, like, you know, we tried sort of regression model, like learning the regression model from the local GIS data. And that didn't give really satisfactory results yet. So you ask your turker to put, put rectangles around a bit of tree. That's right. If you ask them to put rectangles around a bit of grass, would you get the other model? Um, you, we did not do that. Um, <laughs> so we we did we did that um, like by eye on like ten or twenty cameras, but we haven't. I think part of the issue is some, we don't see the grass in that many cameras. Like a lot of the times, the cameras are sort of pointed a little bit up, so we didn't. That, that's why we didn't ask the Turkers to do that. But that might be something to do more rigorously. I like that idea. Hmm. Is that decline after the greening up? Yeah, yeah that's something that, our, that, our bio, that my biology collaborators have not yet discovered. But it's really typical that there's the, 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 the maybe this fits your model of in the spring, it seems really green, right? Yeah. Especially green, right? When the, and and that's, that's, that's very consistently observed. And it's not well understood what that is to the point that they've taken individual leaves and put them in spectrophotometers every day, and they don't see that there. So maybe it's something about the um, when the leaves start off, they're a little bit more rigid, and they point more straight up. And then over time, they sag a little bit. Or if it's dust that's accumulating on the leaves in the actual. Just with the lightness. Right, so there's different ways that this ratio could go down. Yeah. I don't know what the cause of the whiteness decreasing would be. Like, it's not that it's darker later in the summer. Increasing. Uh, 
It's not that it's brighter later in the summer either, really. Um, It changes in leaf defences and things like that over time. Right. Do, do you see flowering? I mean, the trees are clearly flowering in that. that right. Flowering? So the other places that so we do see flowering. We, we we have less of a specific model about how to fit the sigmoid, like to the the flowering, and 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 that doesn't always show up so well. Like flower flowers in different colors, right? And this plot just shows that. But we we do see flowering, and it's relatively easy to detect anytime we are looking for a particular color change. All right, so that was an example of something we can do just by knowing essentially where the cameras are and then using the um, greenness measure as a way to factor out lighting changes and factor out overall intensity and so on. There's also maybe richer things that we can understand about the scene, and we're interested in applying these to understanding what the shape and size of the tree canopy is. But to date, we haven't gotten to surfaces that are as complicated to model as tree canopies. But we're interested in scene structure, um, and so here the model is we're going to assume we know the location of the camera. We're going to assume we know the capture time of every image. We're going to have lots of images. We're going to use variations in lighting to try to understand scene structure. And so this is a picture of my lab in downtown, from my lab in downtown St. Louis. We took a time lapse of images over the course of an afternoon. I haven't gotten movies to work here yet, so you just have to imagine a time lapse of a partly cloudy day with clouds going overhead. We ran principal component analysis on that set of images, and we get a mean image and these 15 most important modes of variation. To help think about these, we took three of them and made them a red, green, and blue channel of a false color image, and we get uh, this picture. And what's compelling about this picture is it captures the first law of geography by Waldo Tobler. Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than far things. And in particular, in this picture, all the pixels that are in blue, which means they have a particular set of values in the first, second, and third principal component image. They're all downtown in St. Louis, about 10 miles away from the camera. The pixels in dark green are at St. Louis University, about six miles from the camera. The pixels in light green or yellow are at the WashU Med School, about three, three uh, miles away from the camera. And these are different sort of distances to trees in the big park in St. Louis. And the reason that principal component analysis creates these overlays is because all of these pixels in these different color channels are either under shadow or not at the same time. So as shadows go overhead, St. Louis is kind of a dead city. There really aren't buildings. Why is my mouth that? There really aren't buildings. Like there's sort of those three chunks of tall buildings in St. Louis. So there aren't things otherwise. So it's a nicely <laughs> segmented city. And as the clouds would go overhead, all of the med school would be under clouds or not, or all of St. Louis University would be under clouds or not, or all of downtown would be under clouds or not. And so that why, that's why it makes a lot of sense for PCA to choose a component to shade all of downtown at the same time. And so it gives this brilliant way of, again, the world's simplest statistical tool giving you a depth segmentation of a scene. So we wanted to try to formalize this. And so we took a, uh, another, this is a, this is a time lapse that I also can't show you from um, somebody who studies atmospheric science at the Czech Republic. Um, and we built an algorithm to try to more formally uh, understand this relationship between correlation of pixels over time and the 3D scene structure. And so that relationship starts by saying, I want to learn a mapping between correlation and distance. And ground level views make that difficult to reason about formally. So we took some satellite pictures and just said, let's look at pairs of pixels. Let's look at the distance between the pairs of pixels in geographic space, or in this case, in the image, because these are satellite pictures. And let's look at the time sequence of each pixel and look at the correlation between the time sequence. And so the correlation between the time sequence is likely to be high for two pixels that are close to each other because the same clouds and the same fronts are going over them at the same time, and the correlation will be lower the farther away you are. And because clouds have a scale invariant property, there tends to be like some small wispy clouds and then big fronts that go across, pixels at different distances may still have correlations even if they're not really close to each other. And so this is the distance to correlation map for um, a couple weeks worth of satellite images across the Atlantic. And then we can make those same distance to correlation maps 
in our scenes in particular. So we can take one landmark pixel, look at its intensity plot over time, and take every other pixel, look at its intensity plot over time, and, look at the, and then color code every pixel by that correlation. And what's interesting about this picture, I think of this as God's flashlights, because it lights up the scene as if you had a flashlight looking straight down at your landmark pixel, because the closer pixels are in real life, in the real world to each other, then the, then the more correlated those are. And so in order to take this cue and translate it into actual 3D models, then we need to find the mapping between correlation and distance, and then we need to build a 3D model that's consistent with that set of distances between those pixels. We are, right, so we are assuming that the clouds are created by some sort of like, and some sort of isotropic like Poisson model of clouds, whatever. so we are not dealing with that at all. And that means it would, might fail in places like looking at mountains where there's like always a sort of cloud right off the mountain ridge or something. So we're, we're completely ignoring that. And we're assuming that the distance to correlation map is the same everywhere in the scene. Um, so we need to solve for this distance to correlation map. And so we have an algorithm overview that first takes their initial data, computes the correlation of the time sequences between every pair of points. That's never going to change. That's driven by the data. And second, we create an initial depth map by assuming the world is planar and fitting that planar world to our correlation map. And that, let, that lets us create a plot of distance to correlation. Once we have a scatter plot of distance to correlation, we can fit uh, a model that tries to give a particular estimate of the distance for every correlation. That gives us an estimate of the distance between all pairs of points. And there is an eigenvalue problem you can solve called multidimensional scaling that converts a set of distances between points into a plausible 3D model of where those points are. You have to modify that slightly because we know our points come from pixels on a camera. So instead of solving for a 3D position of all the points, we solve for the 1D depth along each ray of each pixel that is most consistent with the distances between all, all of it. And so then you can do this iteration where you use the current depth map to compute the distances between the points to get this. That lets you solve for this green line, which is our mapping between correlation to distance. Then we solve the multidimensional scaling problem to re-estimate a depth map. And then we can, that gives us, that will move the distance of every one of these points because now the distances are based on an updated depth map instead of the initial depth map. And over time, this converges to give a model. And I have a movie that doesn't work here, but a prettier scene um, gives us a depth map. And one of the nice things about this depth map is because we're not inferring any smoothness across boundaries, we're computing a depth at every pixel, we get very, uh, very sort of precise and rich um, exact models of the depth at each pixel that don't suffer from blurring over boundaries. Um, and the other thing to, to note is, in this case, our final depth map, or our final distance to correlation map is very flat, and that's because this is a scene that's relatively small compared to the size of the clouds that were casting shadows. Whereas in this scene, oh, I don't have the final depth map. In, in this scene, or in the satellite picture, you get this sort of exponential decay because only the nearby points were often under the same sets of clouds. And so that motivated the use of a non-parametric model for solving for this um, distance to correlation mapping instead of a parametric model. So here's one last scene. Prettier clouds, God's flashlight pictures, and the depth map that we get. It gives you a 3D model, so we're showing the depth map that is the 3D model of the landscape, that's right. So that 3D model is, is um, expressed in terms of it's the, three, like the distances between points. One of the interesting things about that is the location of the camera almost doesn't come into the optimization at all. It's really just constraints about where the points are in the world. Um, although we do, like we know that the points all are constrained to lie along pixels that have to come from rays from some camera, but it's it, unlike a lot of cues, it's not related to depth from the camera. It's really related to points and their relationships to each other. The sky is automatically masked out because we mask the sky out. <laughs> you can actually sometimes see interesting relationships, like if the sun is 
somewhat in front of the camera, you can see where the, shadow, the cloud is that would shadow a particular part of the landscape. Right? And, and so you get that correlation between the location in the sky and the shadow, but we haven't used that in any coherent way yet. In the earlier depth image, the river was black. Does that mean it thinks the river is really far away? We also masked the river out because that reflected up into the sky and confused everything. Do you have any comparisons to ground truth for depth computation? Um, we have in this scene, where is the scene? In this scene, we, we, computed our 3D, we computed the 3D model and measured the distance um, between the bases. And we found that the bases were 99 feet between each other instead of 90 feet. But we reasoned that this is actually in the Czech Republic and maybe they built their baseball field <laughs> the wrong size. Um, That's a typical model that you're supposed to do. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so the so there's actually two there's two cues. So this is from a CVPR paper two years ago. Um, the cue that I showed here is actually um, there's still a scale ambiguity in the cue. Um, there's a, there's a related cue that you can use that looks at the time sequence of pixels in the image and the time lag that is consistent with the highest correlation. And then if you have an accurate estimate of the wind velocity, maybe from some local weather sensor. You can use the wind velocity and the time lag to give you a, a metric response. OK, so 3D scene structure is one variation. Uh, or, or 3D depth. The depth model is one variation of 3D scene structure. Another type of um, uh, structure you can have is to look at the surface normals. And so in this case, we, this is an ECCV paper called heliometric stereo as opposed to photometric stereo. So it's making photometric stereo work with varying directions of illumination from the sun in outdoor cameras. And so we had sequence of images, sequences of images, um, maybe like this, as from the same scene from a static camera where the sun angle is, is varying over time. And so the question is, what does it take to organize this uncontrolled webcam data into something that is accurate enough to estimate the surface normals. And so we largely use the Lambertian lighting model, which has a particular pixel location. The intensity of a pixel location x at time t is uh, the surface normal of that pixel times the lighting direction times a 0, 1 shadow mask, which we have a crappy heuristic to make up, times the albedo at that pixel. So that would be sort of the normal Lambertian lighting model. And so the albedo is the raw surface color. The surface normal we're going to show with this kind of color coding. Um, the shadow mask is a 0, 1 mask. And then to make this more realistic, or to, to the, the, the terms we found that we needed in order to um, solve for this on outdoor images, said a time varying, but it's every, pixel everywhere the same, al, uh, contribution of ambient light. Um, and exposure, because webcams often change either the exposure or the aperture in order to give you sensible looking images at all the times. And then a color response curve. And so that is our imaging model for outdoor imaging. Um, so the color response curve, sometimes we call this a gamma function. It is the number of photons in and how it relates to the 0 to 255 or 0 to 1 brightness that the camera re returns. Um, and so we set this up as an optimization problem where all we know to begin with are the lighting direction, which we assume we know because we know the camera geolocation and the time the camera was captured. We have a heuristic to estimate the shadow mask and we're given the images and then we want to estimate everything else. And what's nice is it turns out that everything else can be solved as a back and forth between two linear equations. So first we can solve for the surface normal and the albedo at each pixel. And then given the surface normal and the albedo, we can solve for the exposure and the ambient light. And then this looks like a nonlinear term, but Sri Nair, um, I guess now almost 10 years ago, computed the camera response functions of the 200 most popular cameras and created a PCA basis for what that camera response function is. And the first five components of that PCA basis capture 98% of the variation of the response function of all 200 of these cameras. So this is also solving for those five nonlinear coefficients. And then we can use that to solve for uh, the surface normal and the albedo. 
and we're going to color code the surface normals with, with, these, uh, with this color. And what's interesting about this is even though we may not know exactly what direction the camera is looking, we know the direction the lighting comes from in geographic coordinates. So our color coding is actually relative to geographic coordinates, not relative to direction to the camera. So this purple color is always a wall that's facing exactly west, for example. And so here are example results. Um, and again, this, um, all of this is done separately at every pixel, which allows us to get really fine resolution in terms of the microstructure at these different surfaces. So here is the albedo that we solved for and the surface normal map and the camera response function. And for another scene. Um, we tried to ground truth this, and I would love to have uh, suggestions of better ways to ground truth this. Our initial way was to use the Google Earth geometry, but Google Earth geometry is actually really poor at building structures, so it doesn't have any of the microtexture along here. It doesn't have any of the trees along here. And so um, we struggled to find a really good way to, to um, evaluate this. But one interesting thing was that you can explore how accurate or how plausible the surface normal maps were for different amounts of, of um, different, amount, different lengths of time that we captured images. And so if you can take images just from one week, then you get this as your output 3D model. And this comes from the fact that the fact that this is bad is due to the fact that the sun is illuminating the scene over the course of a day from different viewpoints. But from day to day, the viewpoints don't change very much. And if you have illuminations that all lie in one plane, then the photometric stereo problem is not well constrained. And so there become many possible solutions, um, something like the bas-relief ambiguity. So there's many possible solutions. So it really takes something like several months worth of data in order to get um, what look to be plausible 3D reconstructions, which is nice if you're trying to justify capturing six years worth of data archives. Could you correlate this with the other features of construction? Did we correlate? So we did not correlate this with the other 3D construction in part because this seems to work best for scenes that are close by. And the other one, like you need the, the, the time lapse of intensities to vary over time. Um, we, we, so so we, the, the pl one plan was to write the paper that combined these two cues, because this gives us beautiful surface normal cue, and then we can, you can't really integrate across these surface normal maps very well because there's discontinuities, and so you could might be able to integrate the 3D model of this region, for instance, like in here, but then to get across these discontinuities, it just doesn't work because it's a discontinuity, so you can't integrate over it. So we had hoped to try to build a, a joint model of both, and we didn't find very often that we get great surface normals at depths um, that were sufficient to use the cloud-based queue so far. All right, so here is our geotemporal image formation model. I have 24,000 webcams, but I'm not satisfied with that. And so recently I've become interested in citizen science and crowdsourcing. And so this is just a um, blatant pitch uh, for, to, but, but to share. So, so we have an app that we call Refoto. It stands for Repeat Photography. It's the world's simplest app. You take a picture, and then if you or somebody else wants to come back later to take another picture of exactly the same object, you see the previous picture half see-through as you're lining up the new picture. So you can wander around. It's actually harder than it seems, but you can wander around and take the same picture. And then if you take pictures of things at different times, you can sort of use that to document changes. And so this is a free app on uh, iPhone and Android. And we are using it now in, I think, seven different places across. So there's a project in Zurich looking at um, rooftop gardens and what their phenology changes are. Although that's very anthro, like, like, like people affect rooftop gardens a lot, right? As they should, because they're rooftop gardens. We are using it to take pictures of um, turtles in the Galapagos and in uh, a park in St. Louis. And we're finding that in that case, the previous picture that we're aligning um, new pictures to is just an outline of the turtle. But that really helps sort of untrained volunteers take pictures at the right distance from the turtle. And we're finding you can use SIFT features on the turtle shell, SIFT plus RANSAC, to identify that it's exactly the same turtle. So we can do capture-recapture experiments without actually tagging 
the same turtle. And then our biggest project is, I think, street trees in New York. And so New York City and Washington, D.C. and several other places in the U.S. have a mandate to have less rainwater pollution run into various ecologically important areas like the East River in New York City. And so either they have to create a $1 billion rainwater runoff treatment plant, or they have to increase the tree canopy coverage in New York City from something like 28% to 34%. Because if there's more leaves that intercept the rain as it falls down, it um, first of all funnels more water underground, and second is a buffer and lets the, uh, that's the current system be able to treat the rainwater um, as is. And so the, New York City has no plan for how they could monitor the health of street trees, a million extra street trees. So the idea is that we can use ReFoto um, as a way of allowing people to adopt a tree. And so here are a couple of the blocks that we did a small test case on. Um, this is also a completely free app so, uh, like that, that I am promoting for you. So if you ever have a project that you would like many pictures of volunteers around the world to take, like we can set up pins for anybody, and it's almost it's going to be an automated process. Um, all right, so maybe that's a good place to stop, so I have time for questions. But I'd like to thank some of the funders and then all the students that put love into these projects, and uh, they're fantastic. Thank you for listening. I like your, uh, you know, your daylight, nighttime um, pictures that you, sh you, you capture through get the positions of cameras. Mm -hmm. And I think you said that you get them down to 50 kilometers or something. Well, I wasn't completely sure whether you were talking about that or the other method. So, so that, that one is the, the median error is 50 miles. 50 miles. Is it? And, but you know, it's, it's just such a lovely regression problem with loads of redundancy and only two parameters. So uh, you know, have you squeezed the last? ounce of accuracy out of that, or is, you know, is 50 kilometers the best uh, miles the best that can be done? Right, so I don't, don't know if we've squeezed the last out of that, but there's reasons why it's not, so, so the reasons that I know of why we didn't do better so far is the, um, our resolution for capturing images is one image per half hour, although we have so many images over the course of the year that that shouldn't be that much of a, of a limiting factor. But the other thing is, depending on the local surface, the local geography, um, when the dawn occurs, like dawn usually occurs some, some fraction of time before the sun actually rises. The, the sky gets significantly brighter. But that depends a little bit on local geography and a little bit on um, how much cloud cover there is. Um, so I think that's, like, if it was just a pure measurement of when dawn was and we had a binary mask of, is it, you know, has the sun risen yet? We should be able to do better, but it does vary from location to location. If you take half an hour is 500 miles, I think, isn't it? Right. That's right. So we're already doing a little bit better so then. You've got 400 measurements during the year. So you divide by square root of 400 as a sort of ballpark for how accurate you should be get up to do. And that comes to about 50 miles, or maybe half. OK. And um, so then I guess the only other place you could squeeze any more is if you interpolated the uh, interpolated the pixels and it wasn't actually a half hour error but something more delicate. Right, so you do, you do get uh, intermediate intensities, right? So there, there is something, there is some possible value there, but that's a better explanation than I've heard of for the 50 miles. <laughs> Have you managed to use the characterization of phenological patterns over the US across the globe from those webcams in actual published studies of you know phenological patterns around the world? Is that work in progress still? Um, there is a paper by Andrew Richardson that is appearing this year in I can I can pass along the reference to you. Um, I think, like, I think the best goal is to try to correct the sat, like, create the, the better regression model to correct the satellite estimates, mm -hmm. and we haven't done that yet. And so we've done a few things here. I think one of the big places where this is most useful is in predicting future responses to climate change. You can use the annual variability of climate factors in each particular year to get statistics of how different species of trees respond 
if it tends to be warmer, more warm in the future, right? And so these natural variations are maybe better ways than trying to go from first principles of tree physiology to see how their, their phenocycle cycle is going to change. What was the signal during the US drought last year? Though? Yeah, there's a huge signal. We, mm -hmm. we, uh, we, have a, we have a visualization tool that we're building called a tale of two years <laughs> that shows this year's picture and last year's picture and lets you wander through the, the like, visual. And it's amazing how different the, like, just how yellow the trees are across a lot of it. Yeah. Simple question. I was wondering if you have any cameras from um, farms looking at crops. We have fewer than I expected. So we, we've, like, I've personally labeled like dozens. Um, we had a mechanical Turk job that went and asked people to label like every camera in terms of 30 or so categories. Um, that had some of the problems that mechanical Turk jobs often have. That you know, uh, so and I don't know if we actually had farm as a category. I don't think we included farm as a category. So maybe that there's just a couple dozen cameras that are labeled as farm. I don't think there's that many cameras. I don't think we've, we've not labeled them. There just aren't that many of farms. There's a growing movement in the US of small vegetable organic farmers. It feels like the US farmers are dramatic about things. I think have a lot of drama. And so that drama instantiates itself in them putting up cameras to show how pretty their crops are. All the time. Well, one of the, I think one of the things you could really help with, of course, is that this is an example where, for, for doing agricultural modeling, that's something we're interested in doing. You know, the most interesting cameras for that will by themselves be incredibly boring. You know, you can imagine just pointing a camera at a, you know, in, in a, a giant field of corn in Kansas or something. It's just not the kind of stuff people would do. But given that you can kick off these projects now, I guess you might be able to get people excited about that by saying, look, you know, if we did have a network of those cameras across the states, we'd have a dramatic improvement in our understanding of of uh, you know responsive crops to drought or something so it's be uh, so I can, it wouldn't surprise me if you don't have many at the moment and even the ones you have might be you know a more interesting bit of the farm like a pond with some geese around it rather than the bit you really want which is just a big field of corn <laughs> right although I think I mean so a you're right that every camera individually is is really quite boring but there's also a growing movement to try to do um, uh, vary how you treat different parts of a, one particular field and you know like even which seeds you plant in different parts and the time course of how the crops are growing or the time course of um, the the moisture if you can tell that like how much like different parts of fields actually get different amounts of rain um, and so people are trying to track that and webcams are one promising approach mm -hmm. to do that I wonder if insurance companies with the reinsurance here in the US where they cover the farmers for that 30% are not covered for crop loss by the government. Um, it's a big area right now. I wonder if it would be in the insurance company's best interest to give the farmers a webcam to monitor the crops, to, to, to say, yes, you definitely do have losses due to drought here. I mean, we have a model which um, huh. reliably tells us whether there has been drought induced. So is the profit model to the validation of the farmer's claim, or is it the insurance company can plan ahead because they'll know ahead of time if it's going to be. I think it'd be validating the farmer's claim was what I had in mind. But yeah, and also anticipating yeah. future losses. Yeah. Hmm. I you should also be able to characterize the difference between trees and grasses fairly well. Right. Well, I mean, just be, by seeing that it's tree or grass or. Yeah. 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 Hmm. There's so much you could do with that. <laughs> Let's finish on that uh, <laughs> on that observation. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.